invite everyone to keep us uh, on track and on time and make sure that we get out of here by midnight. We'll go ahead and get started. So um, I appreciate everyone being here tonight. Why don't we go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Invite the Heavenly Father in here and uh, then we will get started this evening. So Heavenly Father, we come before you. Jesus, I thank you for this evening, Lord. I thank you for, uh, Lord, uh, the folks that are, that are engaging tonight. Heavenly Father, the only goal tonight is to bring glory to your name, to be able to reveal the truth of Scripture, and then, Lord, for us to be able to take the great commission that you've given us and then to go out into this world and to help release prisoners from darkness, set captives free, and declare the year of your favor. So Jesus, be with us now, Lord, as we engage with you and your word, and uh, we just pray that your Holy Spirit uh, will have his way this evening. In your name I pray, amen. All right, I need you, before we get started, I need everyone to make sure that they have a handout, all right? There should be a handout that's going to have all the scripture on it. There is a lot of scripture for tonight, and uh, and so the handouts are in the back, so if you don't have those, uh, make sure that you grab one. And, of course, the scripture will be up here on the screen as well. I have a couple of ground rules for us, so let me just start off by giving you four ground rules. The first one is this, is that this is not meant to be an exhaustive teaching on watchers, Nephilim, and demons. This is not an exhaustive teaching. All that this is, is an introduction to what it is that is in your Bible. Then... My hope is that you will take what it is that has been taught tonight and that you will go and study and that you will look up and that you will check in and that you will dig deeper into what it is that has been introduced to you tonight. Ground rule number two is that there are hundreds of books out out there on this subject. You probably even thousands of books really on this subject. But tonight, the only teaching that I am going to give you is going to be from the Word of God. That's it. There are all kinds of support materials that I could pull from to bring all these stories together and and to make sure that they're all glued together. I am not going to do that this evening. All that I'm going to do is just show you from your Bible what the biblical writers are saying. Just know, though, that the writers of the Bible, all all the authors of the Bible... They did use historical texts that were not divinely inspired, but are historically accurate. They found a lot of them in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, in the caves of Qumran. And so just know that a lot of your scripture is pulled from other texts that, uh, again, I'm not going to dive into tonight, but I just want to let you know that there are other writings out there, certainly on this topic. Number three. It does not matter the translation that you have in your hand right now. I don't care what translation you have. I will be reading from the NIV tonight. That's what all the notes are going to be from the NIV. But the translation does not matter because what matters is what is in the original language. So if you compare the version of the Bible that you had this evening compared to someone else's version, the words may be different. It doesn't matter. You need to go back to the original language and what does that say not just your translation finally ground rule number four you do not have to believe anything that I say tonight and I'm serious about that I don't say that from the pulpit especially on a Sunday morning because we're teaching salvation and sanctification but tonight you do not have to have to agree because what I am teaching tonight does not affect your salvation if you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God that he came to earth as a baby, that he died for your sins, that he rose again on the third day, that he is ascended and sitting at the right hand of the Father right now, and the soon returning king. If you believe that and you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you confess it with your mouth, you believe it in your heart, then the Bible says you are saved. Nowhere in there does it say that you must believe the teaching of watchers, Nephilim, and demons in order to be saved. It is okay to walk out of here tonight the same way that you walked in with the knowledge that you have about these topics, okay? So that's another rule, okay? Everybody good? Let's get started. Let's begin by saying this, all right? In your biblical belief system, you do not have a problem with the Spirit of God impregnating a human woman. 
You don't have a problem with that. Because that would be Mary. And Mary then birthed out Jesus. 100% God, 100% human. In your theology, in your biblical understanding, you do not have a problem with that. You also do not have a problem with ordinary human beings doing supernatural miracles. You don't have a problem with that either because the Apostle Paul raised a, man, raised a kid from the dead. You don't have a problem with that. Of a, of a natural human being doing supernatural things in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have a problem with, with Peter and John uh, healing a crippled man. You also do not have a problem with a supernatural God, the one and only God, walking among humanity on earth. You don't have a problem with God meeting man face to face in the form of a human being. You don't have a problem with that because Abraham. And we'll get to this portion of Abraham where, where God comes with two of his angelic hosts and they all look like men. And Abraham goes up and meets them. You don't have a problem with that. You don't have a problem with giants. You don't have a problem with giants. And the most notable giant in the Bible, of course, is Goliath. Killed by a little shepherd boy by the name of David. In all of our biblical teachings, we don't have a problem with those things. So why then, if we can accept all of these biblical stories as truth, then why are we so put off when the Bible clearly states that the supernatural realm continually mixes with this natural realm? Why do we want to explain away what is happening right here, right now on the earth if we believe that all these other supernatural things are happening in your Bible. Over the next few minutes, that's what I wanted to do is I want to introduce you to some passages of Scripture. And my prayer is, is that your eyes are going to be opened to what it is that is actually happening in this world that we are living in right here, right now. Then... With the knowledge that you are given this evening, I trust that it will spark in you an absolute passion to be obedient to Christ and to do what it is that He is calling us to do. And that is go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. There is no other agenda for me to teach you this tonight other than to spark you into obedience to go into the world and make disciples the great commission that Jesus has given to all of us. So, look at the first one there on your page. It's Psalm 82 and verse number 1. Psalm 82, 1, this is what it says. It says, God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. Now, in the original language, this is how it would read. Elohim presides in the great assembly. And he gives judgment among the Elohim. Now, at first glance, you may say, wait a minute. Is the Bible talking about a pantheon? Is the Bible talking about many gods that are ruling this world? That is not what it states. We make this clear from the very beginning. There is only one God, and his name is Yahweh. Elohim is actually a place. Elohim means a place. It's a place of residence. So there is only one God, Yahweh, but there are many Elohim. And God uses this Elohim, they are called a divine council. And God uses them to help run the universe. God does not need any help, but he chooses to use the help of a divine council found in Psalm 82 verse number 1 to help run this universe. He doesn't need it. But he chooses to use it. A very loose analogy maybe to help you to begin to understand this from the very beginning. Is that if you take the mayor of a city. And the mayor of a city has a city council. And what they do is they try to administer law. They, they, they want to administer justice. And they want to have administration on how to run the city and to make decisions. But everything falls on the shoulders of a mayor. Now again, very loose analogy for what I'm trying to explain. God does not need a divine counsel, but he chooses to use one. Now, let me show you some examples of this divine counsel at work. 
The first one is going to be found in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse number 19. And this is what's going to happen, is that the, the divine council is going to be in session with God, and they are discussing, what do we do with King Ahab? God is going to inquire of his counsel, and this is what it says. Look at verse number 19. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the hosts of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. That's the divine counsel. Verse number 20. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this, another that. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets, he said. That's one of the divine council members that just said that. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. You just sat in on a session of a divine council where God is presiding over the other Elohim. And he says, we've got this king. What should we do with him? Do you even find it interesting that the suggestion of lying, where is God sitting in this verse? On his throne, right? This is in the presence of a holy God, but yet one of his divine council members says, hey, I know what we can do. Let's put a lying spirit. If that's one of God's top ten, I find it very interesting that there's a negotiation that happens at the very throne room of God. Now there's another session where the divine council is coming together. This time, Satan is a part of it. In the book of Job, Saint, you know the story, all right? I, don't have the, I didn't pull the scripture up on this one, but you know the story in the book of Job. Satan must come and give an account to God. Where have you been and what have you been doing? I've just been going around the earth back and forth. Satan has to answer God. And then there is a conversation that begins to take place between God, Yahweh, and then another Elohim. Satan, Lucifer. And they begin to talk about Job, and there is a conversation, a give and take, that begins to happen here. God is the ultimate judge. He can do whatever it is that he desires to do, but he's choosing to use a divine counsel to say, well, what do you think you should do? Another session of the divine counsel is found in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 8. The divine counsel is in session once again in front of God. They are giving an account to what it is that's happening, and they're making decisions on how to run the universe. And God is allowing this to happen. But this time, a human is actually attending this divine council meeting. In verse number 8, this is what it says. It says, Then, the Lord, th then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I, it's talking about Isaiah, you know what your Bible says, that's Isaiah. He says, and I said, here I am, send me. Even in the presence of God, the other Elohim that God has created, he's created them all, they can sit in the presence of God. Satan himself can enter into the presence of God and have a conversation. Mankind can enter into the presence of God. And have a conversation with the one and only true God, Yahweh. And we get to help and they get to help administer what happens on this earth. You've heard it said in Genesis chapter 1 verse number 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. Who will go for us is what Isaiah said. Is God talking to himself, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Or when God said in the book of Isaiah, who will go for us, is he talking about the divine counsel? What's happening here is that you have heard it taught that in this particular passage of Scripture, the us in the Genesis 126 Scripture is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's talking to himself. I would contend that that is wrong. He's not talking to himself. There is only one God. There is only one creator. But we're trying to figure out what do these guys look like. All right, what does these divine counsel look like? For this answer, you need to go to Job 38, verse number 7. Job 38, 7. 
where were you, this is God talking to Job at the end of Job, again, you know your Bibles, so where were you at the laying on the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you possess understanding. Who determined its measurements? Yes, you do know. Or who stretched out the measuring line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars were singing together and all of the sons of God? That's an important phrase. When all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Who was with God before the earth was created, before the first foundation was laid, the sons of God, his divine counsel, was with God before, according to this passage, according to your Bible, this is what it says, before the foundation was even laid, God had created this divine counsel. So, what does the son of God look like? Sons of God look like. What do they look like? Well, for that answer, we go to Genesis chapter 18, verse number 2. Genesis 18, 2. Here what we're going to see is we're going to see three men that are going to approach Abraham. When they approach Abraham, Abraham has no idea, no clue at all that the one who is standing before him is God Yahweh himself and two of God's divine council members. Abraham has no idea. All that he thinks is that there are three men approaching him. You know why? Because they look just like him. And he looks just like them. Look at verse number two. Abraham looked up and he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. This bowing right here, right now, is not worship. The bowing that is happening here is a greeting that was happening in those ancient times. He is not bowing to worship because he has no idea who it is that's standing in front of him. Because they look just like us. Entertaining angels. Hebrews 13 too. Let me show you something else. To prove the point even more, we are created in the image of God himself and his divine council members, Hebrews 13, 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. You and I cannot tell the difference between a human being and one of God's divine council members. When God said, let us create man in our image. God, Yahweh, is the one and only sole creator of everything. All mankind and everything. But what he was doing is looking around at his divine council members and say, I got a great idea. Why don't we make man look like us in our image because they we look like them they look like us and so in God's divine counsel and all of them were present and active at the beginning of, of creation when God created Adam they were all there that's what Job said Job said that they were all there they've already been created and so the first human Adam is now created what did God notice about Adam Think about this. Think about your story of Adam and Eve. There's the spoiler alert. Is that Adam needed a helpmate. There was no one suitable for him. That's found in Genesis chapter 2 in verse number 18. This is what we need to notice about Adam. Because Adam was created in the image of God. Just like the rest of the, of the divine council. So God creates Adam. Verse number 18. The Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I. Do you see where he says this now? He didn't say we. Now he says I. I will make a suitable, a suitable helper for him. Why? Because the divine council's never seen a woman before. They have no idea what God is about to create. A suitable helper called to work alongside of Adam, not taken from the ground but taken from man, the rib from the side of him. So Adam and Eve are now created. 
Eve, women are very unique to all the, everything that God has created. Woman is probably the most unique. What, are, what is their job? What job did God give to Adam and Eve? We find that in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 28. God blessed them and said to them, here's their job, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature that moves on the ground. What is the human being's job? To rule over the earth and fill it with more human beings. Procreate. Having sexual relations, one man, one woman, in a covenant together, and make more human beings. That's what the job of a human is. That's what God gave us to do. So what happens then when a divine counsel begins to get involved and actually sins? Well, for that you need to look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 2. Because they are going to do something that they were never created for or intended to do. This divine counsel of God that was there from the very beginning that God himself created, that he uses to run this world, to run this universe, to run everything that he does, they're about to do something that they should have never, ever, ever done. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 2. The sons of God, there it is again, the sons of God, these are other Elohim, these are not men. Human beings. These are, other human, these are other Elohim. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. Now your Bible's getting weird. All of a sudden things, if it, did, if it wasn't weird yet, things just got really strange in your Bible in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 2. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. It's not in your notes, but if you want to write that on the side. Daniel chapter 4, verse number 17. He refers to the sons of God. Daniel refers to the sons of God as watchers. Watchers. Anytime you see sons of God, that would be a watcher. So the watchers married human girls. Were human girls created for the sons of God? No. Human girls were created for human men, not for anything in the Elohim or sons of God or watchers. But the watchers left their place, disobeyed what it is that God had originally commanded them to do, and they engage with women, human women. What do, what do the sons of God do once they have wives? Well, let's look. Verse number four is that they have babies. Okay? Verse number four. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. We'll get to that here in just a minute. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. You can't get past what your Bible just said. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. Again, we're going to come back to the whole and afterward thing. But what I want you to see is that there was sexual relations that happened between the sons of God watchers and human girls. And they created a hybrid race that was never ever intended to walk this earth and be here. The watchers left their place. They sinned and engage sexually with human women, creating what the Bible says are Nephilim. You have heard it taught that angels cannot reproduce. Nowhere in your Bible does it say that an angel or any of these Elohim beings cannot reproduce. It does not say that. It just says that they don't. And I know what Jesus said in that passage and he says that they will be like the angels. What does that mean? We don't need to procreate. Doesn't mean we can't. We just won't need to. Why don't they reproduce? Because they don't have a helpmate. The helpmate was created for Adam. There is no helpmate, a sexual partner, for any of these watchers and Elohim, these sons of God. 
So what happens is, is that these watchers, they step outside the bounds and they sin. They have sexual relations with human women. God is not happy about this. So this is why God created hell. You ever wonder why God created hell? Why would God create hell? Does he want to send humans there? I will argue he does not. Hell is not created for human beings. It was originally created for these sons of God who sinned and had sex with human girls, creating the Nephilim, a hybrid race that has an infected bloodline that begin to taint the entire world. What happened to the ones that sinned? Understand, we have a just God, and he took immediate action. You'll find it in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, what was the sin? Having sex with the human girls, creating these Nephilim. So when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. That is why God created hell. To hold them in until the judgment. Jude 1, 6, this is what it says. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority. You see what that says? It's the divine council. They had authority. Who did not keep their authority, but they abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound in everlasting chains for, the great, for judgment on that great day. Why did God create hell? He created it for the sons of God because they lost their position, because they had sex with human girls. They created offspring that then became in total rebellion to God. And the Nephilim are unredeemable. Who are the offspring? Go back to Genesis chapter 6, verse number 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, the men of renown. Now, I want you to go to Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 33. Numbers 13, 33 should be next on your list. Israel has been delivered from Egypt. Moses is now sending spies out into the promised land. When the spies come back, they come back with a report. What do they say? What was the reason that they did not, the first time, they did not go into the promised land with Moses? You can say it out loud. What was the reason? Giants. Giants. Let's look at giants then, verse number 33. Let's see what the spies actually say. We saw the Nephilim there. What are Nephilim? They are the offspring of the sons of God having sex with human girls and creating this hybrid race. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. Again, the main reason for Israel not going into the promised land originally with the spies is because of these guys, the Nephilim, the giants. Something that is not fully human, but not also fully divine or, or supernatural. It's a mix. Nephilim, where did they come from again? Sons of God having sex with those human girls, hybrid race. And what God is saying is this. God says, you know what? This absolutely needs to be completely dealt with. This bloodline needs to be over. And so what God chooses is for Israel to be his finger of judgment and begin killing the bloodline, completely wiping it off the face of the earth. I want to ask you something. I want you to think in your own head and think, of your, think, of your, think in your own heart here. Do you have a problem with God killing men? Not mankind, but men. Do you have a problem with that? Eh, there's war and there's stuff, and that's sad, but God killing men. How do you feel about God killing women? What do you feel about God killing children? Where's your theology in God killing babies? It's kind of messed up, isn't it? But, look at what your look again what the word what the word says. <clears throat> 
What the word says in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 3. We have King Saul. All right. Now we've crossed well into the promised land. We now have a king in there. And this is what God says. He says, now go and attack the Amalekites. This is 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 3. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. It's one thing to kill a man. It's another thing to kill a woman. Why in the world would this awesome, loving, generous God that we talk about all the time, that we have accepted Yahweh, Jesus Christ, why would He kill babies? Unless there's a reason, because there's a bloodline in those babies that is absolutely unredeemable because it's coming from a line of blood that is an Absolute positive rebellion against God. And it all started when watchers came down to earth and had sex with human girls, creating this bloodline called the Nephilim. Is God prejudiced against His creation? There's a great question for today, isn't it? Is God prejudiced against His creation? Does He hate one race more than another? Does He love one race more than another? I will tell you right now, God loves every human. God has created every single human being, and God loves His creation, period. But when there is something that has entered into the earth that God never intended to happen, and He says, I need to completely eradicate that and so he begins to send judgment because it's absolutely unredeemable who is the most famous nephilim who is the most famous nephilim of the entire bible you will find him in first samuel chapter 17 and verse number four. First samuel 17 4 his name is goliath before we read this passage you know the story of david and goliath i don't need to explain anything to you on this I need, you to ask, I need you to really ask yourself a question. Israel itself is one of the most powerful armies today and back in biblical times. All right? True statement. One of the most powerful armies around in this world. Plus, especially back in biblical times, they had God on their side. So people were afraid of Israel. Number two, the question you need to ask yourself is, how does one tall man keep an entire army of Israel led by God up on a hill and at bay is it just because he's nine feet tall doesn't make any sense does it one man keeping an entire army away then once a little shepherd boy comes in with a sling and a stone knocks him down and then takes a sword and cuts his head off and kills him All of a sudden, the Philistines don't even come down to fight. Their hero is dead, and their entire army turns around and runs. And now all of a sudden, Israel has all the courage to run down the hill into the valley and up on the other side and to pursue the Philistines. Why? Because maybe, just maybe, the story changes If you see Goliath as not fully human, but instead as a Nephilim, something that we would say today in our lingo and say would be a demigod. Not fully human, not full Elohim, sons of God, but something, some kind of a hybrid race with supernatural strength and height, and everybody knew it. Look at verse number four. Champion named Goliath. He was from Gath, and he came out of the Philistine camp, and he was over nine feet tall. Now look at 1 Samuel 17, 50. There's a little boy, we know him as David, and he goes out and he kills this giant, this Nephilim. Verse number 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. That is very, as a very important biblical text, because it just showed us That that bloodline can be killed. All right? It can be killed. Let's go back to Genesis 6 now. All right? Keep up with me. 
I'm building something here for you. Let's go back to Genesis 6, pre-flood, okay? Pre-flood. Nephilim are on the earth. The earth is absolutely corrupt. Just know that when God said He looks at the earth and He sees the corruption on the earth, what He sees are giants like Goliath that are ruling over the earth mixed with humans. And God says, I must bring judgment. And so God brings the flood to stop that bloodline. We've established that the sons of God procreated with human women. They produced offspring called the Nephilim. Now, look at what the next verse says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. So the Nephilim are on the earth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and it was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. God is now going to come to war and judgment with the earth. And it's because of a bloodline of Nephilim. Now, he's going to destroy men, he's going to destroy women, and he's going to destroy children at the time of the flood. This does not discount human nature. What happened in Genesis between Satan and Adam and Eve. There is still human nature that is involved in this. So it's not all just about the giants. It's not all just about these sons of God and watchers. It's not all about that. There are still human beings that are on the earth. But the problem is, is that back in the Garden of Eden, human beings sinned, therefore putting putting enmity between between God and humans. And God says, I need to, re- I need to, to bring back and redeem the humans. But these other things out there, God says, I'm going to completely annihilate and I'm going to destroy them. From other passages, we see that that this corrupt bloodline is certainly here. At this point in our Bibles, again, we're not not disregarding uh, the human nature of things. Now, if you're following along, we've got the flood. We had giants and Nephilim that were on the earth before the flood. We have humans that were on the earth before the flood. We know from Hebrews that Noah was trying to preach to the humans, actually, and saying, hey, repent and get into the ark. Get into the ark of safety because the judgment of water is coming. But no one did except for Noah and his wife and then his sons and their wives. So now they're on the ark. If you believe in the global flood, which I do, I don't think it was regional. I think it was absolutely global that everything everything on earth died. Okay, everything that has breath died. Then the question you should have is, how did Goliath get here then? If everything died in Genesis 6, how did Goliath, how, how did Goliath and the Nephilim come back? Remember, Genesis, Genesis 6, chapter 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. There's a couple of thoughts on this. No one knows for sure. There's a couple thoughts on how they got here afterwards. Thought number one. Someone in Noah's family carried the blood of a Nephilim. Thought number one. Thought number two. A new set of the divine council did it again. Left their position, sinned, came down, and had sex with girls, and created yet another line after the flood of Nephilim. That's another thought. Or thought number three. Because the Nephilim were partially human, that means that they have a spirit that is eternal. So when the Nephilim dies, like Goliath or even during the flood, when they died, where does their spirit go? Think about that. Where does it go? Where did the spirit of Goliath go? Our teaching would say, our Sunday school classes and even from the pulpit would say that they would go to hell. But hell is a place that is being locked up right now for those that are going to be in judgment. So the third thought is, how did these Nephilim get back here? Is that when a Nephilim died, 
this hybrid, died, their spirits still are on the earth, but they are now disembodied from the flesh that they once embodied, and they are now the demons that we deal with today. We know that demons can oppress. We know that demons can possess. And so the thought process is, how did the Nephilim get back on here? They came back. Because if, if everything was done, they came back because Goliath is here. That's what they called him, the Nephilim. How'd they get back here? Could it be that a demon possessing, possessing a human being and having sexual relations with another, a male to female sexual relations of now creating yet another bloodline that is unredeemable, Nephilim. Demons, let's explore demons just for a minute. You've heard it taught, all right, so let me address this. You've heard it taught that Satan rebelled against God. When he did, he took one third of all the angels. They became the following angels. That's how we get demons today. The problem is, is that your Bible doesn't say that. There's nowhere in your Bible where it says what it is that I just described. The only place that comes remotely close to Satan in one third is going to be found in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 4. Where John, he paints a picture, it's a picture of a constellation. Where one third of the stars are hurled to earth. But it's a constellation that is depicting Mary birthing Jesus and Satan would be the dragon. And he's waiting to devour the baby. Look at verse number 4. His tail is out of Revelation. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who would rule the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched to God and to his throne. What is the timeline of this revelation occurrence? It's the birth of Jesus Christ. So, if the teaching is that Satan took one third of the angels in a rebellion, and then they came down to the earth and, they, and those became demons, that would have happened at the birth of Jesus until now. But, your Bible shows that there were demons before the birth of Christ. So the timeline doesn't work. So demons are not one third of the stars being wiped. This is not talking about that. The demons that we deal with today are disembodied spirit of a hybrid bloodline because the sons of God had sex with human girls and created something that is unredeemable, unredeemable in an absolute rebellion to God. They can die, but their spirits are still here oppressing and possessing human beings today. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. Let's talk about Lucifer. Let's talk about the fall. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. Satan is not in hell yet. He is roaming the earth. So, he lost his position. Nothing there is said about him taking one-third of the angels. Those are not demons, okay? Let's keep going. Let's talk about demons a little bit. Let's talk about a man possessed by a demon. Jesus encounters a man in, in Mark chapter 5 and verse number 2. And this is what it says. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore. I want you to think about Goliath, okay? I want you to think about Goliath. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the iron on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Why was this man so strong? Because he was possessed by a disembodied spirit of a Nephilim that is called a demon. And the demon has supernatural strength that can enter into a human being and create 
something that other human beings cannot even control because it's so strong. The demon speaks. Take a look at this. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. What does that mean? Remember hell? And the other, the other, he knows where his father is in hell right now. Don't torture me. Don't send me there. Verse number 8. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. This is a conversation between an evil spirit and Jesus. Because Jesus exercised that demon from that man. The demon is what it is that's talking to Jesus. The man has been set free. So, judge, because he doesn't want to go to hell. Verse number 9. Then Jesus said to him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Now that's very strange. Not just, not, don't, just don't send us to hell, but let us stay in this area. Why? Because a demon knows its territory. A demon has authority over certain territories. It has rule, it has power, and it has authority. Paul addresses this demonic fact, this demonic rule on earth, when you look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. How they have a rule over all the areas of the earth. Take a look at this. You ever wondered, you, ever, you know this verse. You ever wondered about this verse? For your battle, our battle, is not against flesh and blood. We don't have a problem with human beings. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is not against human beings. Our struggle is against rulers, authorities, and powers. Who are they? The demons. Because they are in the areas, in the regions. Don't send us away from our region. We have rule in this region. We have power in this region. We know how to run this region. Don't send us anywhere else, they said to Jesus. So naturally, then, our first thought goes, again, back on this, on this whole demonic thing, and the sons of God is, what do these things look like? I mean, you ever really wonder this? What does a demon look like? What does a Nephilim look like? What do the sons of God look like? I will tell you, we look just like them, and they look like us. It is my belief, you do not have to believe this, it is my belief that the bloodline of the Nephilim still exists today because the Bible says it was here before and after. I believe that there are those who walk this earth who are unredeemable because they are not human, not fully human. And God brought flood first, water first, but He's bringing fire the next time. And He's going to take care of everything. With all my heart, I believe that every one of us in here has most likely interacted with one. Again, my belief system on this. That we have interacted with a power, with a ruler, with an authority. If you've ever used the phrase, how could one human being do that to another? I really have to question, is that actually a human being? A, different, a demon is different though than a Nephilim because a demon needs a host. A Nephilim that has been killed, its spirit, its disembodied spirit, is still locked in here. This is why we see the oppression and possessions of people. Because it still wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Because that's what it was created to do. When you look at Daniel chapter 10. Look at Daniel chapter 10. Alright, we're talking about authority now. Okay, The authority that these things have. Keep up with me, alright guys. 
Verse number 12. You know the story of Daniel here, so I don't need to explain it. Do not be afraid, Daniel. This is, this is Gabriel talking to Daniel. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your, your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. I have come in response to them. So that means Gabriel is one of the messengers of God. He is an angel of God. It does not necessarily mean he's part of the divine council, but he certainly is a messenger. He says, I've come in response to them. Verse number 13. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Stop. The prince of the Persian kingdom. Is that a spiritual thing? Or is that something that looks like us, but is not fully human? And able to resist even the strong angel Gabriel. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there by the king of Persia. If nothing else, whether that is physical, that king of Persia, whether that is actually physical, or whether that is something that is happening in the supernatural, all that we know is that that king of Persia was evil, and it had rule, it had authority, and it had power enough to keep one of the strong angels of Gabriel at bay until another angel came down to get it out of the way so that, this, so that Gabriel can complete his message. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Let's look more about this authority that the demonic has. Luke chapter 4, verse number 5. We're in the temptation between Lucifer and Jesus Christ when he's in the desert. The devil led him to the high place and he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you their authority. See that there's the word again, ruler, authority, power. I will give you their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone that I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Who has authority over the cities of the world? Lucifer. Does Jesus argue that and say, no, you don't? He doesn't. That means that that actually is a true statement. For a time, Lucifer has control of the cities that we live in, as well as all around the world. These divine entities, all right? When I say divine, I just mean other, they're not godly, okay? But they are in control of our cities and they are still allowed today to have power and influence. Just turn on your TV today in our own city and you will find murders within the last 48 hours in our city. You will still find people killing people, hurting people and doing everything. And that's just in our city. Not to mention all the other cities all around the world. Jesus makes a note, it's in Matthew 24, 37, when he says this, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Human beings, human beings, you and I, we have a human nature that puts us in a personal rebellion towards God. I believe that there is a Nephilim bloodline that is still in existence today. And the devil and the sons of God are continually allowed to have rule, to have power, and to have authority over this world that we are living in right now. And demons, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that were drowned back during the flood and any Nephilim that has died since, continue to roam the earth in order to kill, steal, and destroy humans because they hate us because we are created certainly in the image of God and we are the ones who can be redeemed and they can not so the question comes to this is there any hope at all is there any hope in all of this and of course the answer is yes his name's Jesus Jesus is the only hope for this absolute disastrous mess 
that is going on in our world today. Revelation chapter 19, verse number 16 says this, On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Here comes the victory, my friend. Our king has already won. The title of placing Jesus the king of kings, it means that there are other kings. Lord of lords, there are other lords. There's other authorities that are ruling. Jesus is above all of them. And Jesus is the one who even now still rules the world but allows Satan to have his way for a time. But Jesus is the true King of kings, Lord of lords. Because of his death, because of his, of his burial, and because of his resurrection, he has victory over everything. Demonic, Nephilim, Watcher, anything you want to call it, Jesus has victory over it all. The wisdom of God is so much greater than anything that is in power right now. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for, for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. That is this demonic realm. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, look at this, did you know this is in your Bible? They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If these demons, if these Nephilim, if these sons of God, these watchers, if they would have known that killing the Son of God would mean their demise and ultimately lose all of their power, that passage says they would not have done it. You know what this means? God is wiser. God is greater. God is stronger. God won. Jesus won. Understand that God has now put into a place a plan of redemption for us, for mankind. We need saved. We need saved from this world. We need saved from the sin that, that separates us in our own nature. We need saved. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Does God love human beings? Yes, every single one of them. In the Old Testament, the men, the women, the, chi the children, the infants, God does not change. He still wants everyone to be saved unless they are part of a bloodline that is unredeemable, and that would be out of this Nephilim blood. I hope your Bibles are making sense to you. Does God want you to go to hell? Absolutely not. God does not want any human being to go to hell. Hell was created for those watchers who sinned. That's who hell is created for. But if any human being that God has created chooses to not accept a free gift of salvation, then the only place for eternity for that individual human soul is a place called hell that was originally created for these demons and for these watchers and for these Nephilim. God does not want to send anyone there. It's a choice that a human has. Will you spend eternity with God or will you spend eternity with in hell. Authority has been given back to mankind. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 7. Jesus is going to tell them this. When Jesus is here with his disciples, he's going to tell them about the authority. They're watching authority all around them. And let me just tell you, the disciples, Peter for sure, because he writes about it, they believe in these Nephilim giants. They, they believe this stuff. Whether you choose to believe or not, it's up to you. They believed this. So when Jesus is talking about authority, they understood exactly what he's talking about. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 7. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, 
Freely you must give. Death, sickness, disease, demons, all of this is part of this dark world that we live in. The amazing thing is, Jesus said, I have given you power over all of that because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You have power over the demonic. You have power, if Nephilim and the bloodline still exist, you have power over that because of the Holy Spirit living in you. Even the sons of God, the watchers, especially those who sin, you have power over them because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Luke chapter 10, verse number 17. The disciples exercised that power. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They're excited because they know what a demon is. They know how powerful it is. That's what they're excited about. Jesus, he's pleased with the report, but look what it says in verse number 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority, there's that word, authority, to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Nobody in here needs to be afraid. However, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This fall of Satan is not Satan being kicked out of heaven. That's not it. What Jesus is describing is his fall of power. Because now, individual men that, God has, that Jesus has given the power to, exercised it, it worked, and now all of Satan's power is beginning to crumble and fall. He has no power over you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You are the most powerful entity, human, that walks the earth because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. As Christians, we are given authority in this kingdom right here on earth. Look at, look at how the authority of God transfers to us. It's going to be found in Isaiah chapter 62, or I'm sorry, chapter 61, verse number 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives. Freedom for the captives. To release from darkness for the prisoners. Captives and prisoners, that's what the demonic, that's what Nephilim, that's what the watchers, all of them have people, humans, in prison and darkness. But we get to set them free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of you. You can have victory over Satan. That's a really good place to shout amen. Yeah. Yeah. All of this talk back here, it actually means nothing now. You know why? Because you have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Anything that I've talked about, anything that I have explained, you should not even get excited to talk about demons. What you get excited about is knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what we get excited about. Not about Nephilim, not about demons, not about watchers. Because you hold more power and authority in this world than any demonic imp that is walking around right now. John chapter 15, verse number 19. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He tells them, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. Who controls the world right now? Authority, ruler, or power? Satan. So if you belong to it, you would be one of its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The rulers, authorities, powers, Ephesians 6, that run the world right now. You know why they hate you? Because you have more ruler, authority, and power because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You are are more powerful than they are. Not because of you, but because of the one who lives inside of you, because of the salvation that is brought to you, and they hate you. They hate you. They hate me. 
They want you dead. Okay? They want you distracted. They want you depressed. They want you oppressed. They want you possessed. But you have more power because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you to absolutely change the world. In the meantime, Jesus has given us orders. These are, these are what the orders are. The orders are found in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 19 and 20. This is what it says. Therefore, go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Did you see what it said there? All nations. Who has control over the cities right now? Satan. But Jesus said, if you were a disciple of Jesus Christ, that you are to go to all nations where these things are ruling and have power and authority and begin to overthrow it because of the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Your battle is not with flesh and blood. Your battle is not with another human being. Your battle is against everything in this unseen realm, but is showing itself in physical ways. Ephesians 6.13, what do we need to do? Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, when you see the evil face to face, whether it be through demon, whether it be through some bloodline of a Nephilim, whether it be a watcher itself, when the day of evil comes, that you can what? Run away and cower because you have no authority? It's not what it says. So that you can do what? So that you might be able to stand. To stand your ground. And saying, looking Satan directly in the eye and saying, you don't scare me. You have no power over me. You have no authority over me. You have no rule over me. Stand your ground. And after you have done everything, stand. Too many Christians, too many churches are giving the ground back to Satan. I'll make a whole sermon on that later. Here's the bottom line. Stop sinning, period. Stop being selfish. And stop thinking that the relationship with Jesus Christ is all about you and just Jesus and nobody else is involved. We are called to go and to share the good news. Because there's people out there that are bound up, real human beings that are bound up by real demonic forces. But there is more authority in you than there is on anything that has anyone bound up in darkness. Matthew 22, 37 to 39 breaks it down simple for us. Jesus replied, Love the Lord God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody in here want to see the world change? Thank you. Anybody in here want to see cities that are dropping to their knees and coming to Jesus? Anybody want to see peace and love and real harmony happening in here? Good. Let's go do our job. Let's go stand when the world wants to push us back because it's, it's asserting an authority on us. But we are following the King who has already won, and his name is Jesus. So do we need to fight another human? Nope, my battle is not with any human being. There is no battle with another human being. I love people, and you should too. But if there is anything demonic, nephilimic, if that's a word, a watcher, sons of God, that wants to come against, oh, we can fight then. And like David, we're allowed to annihilate them from the earth. All right? I'm not saying that it's murder and stuff. Don't take it that way. Finally, here's the thing. When you begin to walk in the authority that Jesus has given you, all right, we'll end with this. When you begin to walk in the authority that Jesus Christ has given you, something about authority Nipping at the heels of every human being is pride. Look what I can do. You have the authority to heal the sick, to raise the dead. You have the authority to exercise demons. 
None of this is done for your own glory. It is done for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I've been asking Jesus, how do we even close this? And I've got to be honest with you is that I don't know. At this point, I don't know. I've given you just a glimpse of what it is that I've been studying for the last year and a half, two years. Believe it or not, there's so much more. But that's enough for today.